Stephen is employed by Essex Police as Crime Prevention, Tactical Advisor, Heritage Crime Prevention Lead and Signing Out Crime Officer. Here we go. Thank you, Alice. It's um, always that challenging uh, presentation to deliver just after lunch, especially with such a lovely lunch that we've been given. So if any of you start to doze off, I'll know it's the lunch and not me. <laughs> 20 minutes isn't a great length of time to actually talk about crime prevention. Um, so really what we're going to give you is just a taste of... Oh, I've got to put the slide up actually, anyway. There we go. Yeah. Right. Um, so what you're going to get is basically just a taster on crime prevention um, to perhaps get your interest and make um, you think about security in relation uh, to projects that you've got in mind. Um, this afternoon uh, there doesn't seem that well, there's no question and answer session. Um, so if you do have any questions then please do grab me during the tea break and I'll endeavour to answer them. Or alternatively um, towards the end, if you take a photograph of the slide with my contact details, um, drop me an email and I'll try and answer your questions there. <coughs> On the last slide that I've got after my contact details, there's one with some useful web addresses um, for further information, and again, you may wish to take a photograph <coughs> of those. Looking at what you've got there, Winston Churchill, famous for lots of his quotes, but I do like this one that he's put here is that we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Um, the quote was made after the Blitz in London when the Houses of Parliament were severely damaged that was talking about that. But when you think about it, so all of us in whatever role we've got all have a responsibility to protect our heritage and culture for this and future generations. So when do you think about security? This is normally the case, unfortunately. Um, security is not one of those things that we think about very often. Um, but it should be. If you're actually seeking funding for a heritage project, or if you're actually providing funding for that heritage project, you don't want to go back and ask for more money afterwards because of the result of crime. Um, you've lost a, a proportion of that funding that you had. So think about your security even before you start entering into a project of any nature. So it's at that concept time. During the project as well, um, you may well have building work going on during the project. Our friendly people out there that will take anything that's not bolted down and that's bolted down, um, will look at your projects while you're actually constructing. So look at it then. Look at it afterwards as well, because once you're using the building, you need to make sure that your security is there. Not the building, collections that you have, but the people as well that are going to be using those buildings. Going beyond that, think about your disaster recovery plan. There have been a lot of talks this morning uh, that listened to. Very interesting, and a lot of what's been said there overlaps into each person's, the fire, the police, and the other uh, presentations. The same principles there. So your disaster recovery plan it may well be that you've had a fire, you've had a flood or something. <coughs> you've emptied everything out of the building, which was at that time lovely and secure. You had your security systems on it. But what's happening to what was in that building once it's been removed? Have you thought about your disaster recovery plan actually thinking about security and ensuring that those artefacts are protected when they're in temporary um, placement? Yeah. What's heritage crime? Well, to start off with, there's 400,000 sites and buildings designated as heritage assets around the country. Most of these um, sites are actually in public hands, so it's not National Trust or English Heritage owning them, but most of them are in, that, in public hands. And you know that there's a problem when uh, there's actually a definition of heritage crime. Heritage and cultural property crime can be defined as any offence involving damage or loss to the historic environment, including all offences involving cultural property. Now that came about from the National Police Chief Council as a heritage and cultural crime working group. Um, I sit on that in relation to crime prevention. 
And so the document that you see there is the National Strategic Assessment of 2017. And that's the second one that came along where we're looking at heritage crime generally. And so out of that document also came uh, a document to the Sentencing Council for Magistrates' Courts. Um, this looks at actually providing uh, an aggravating factor for any theft or handling offences. And so if the person is arrested and goes before the court, then the penalty they receive can be increased if it's related to heritage crime. Now, for that to actually work as well, if you are actually a victim of a crime in relation to your heritage buildings, try and make sure that somewhere, uh, when you make that report, you get your local police force to record it as heritage crime. It may just be in the free text, but the problem that we have generally with the National Police Chiefs Council group is knowing the amount of heritage crime that's out there. Heritage <coughs> crime on its own isn't a listed offence. The burglary, the theft are all recorded. It's that heritage element that we need. Um, so you've got that as a, an aggravating factor and it shows you what a sad bunny I am. When I got back from the, um, the drinks yesterday evening, I went on my uh, police handheld device looking at emails that have come in and there was one that's coming from the Heritage Alliance newsletter. So hot off the press last night is that not only have we got theft, theft and handling offences, but um, released on the 3rd of July is the fact that criminal damage and arson offences are also going to be included. And that comes into effect on the 1st of October this year. So there's quite a catalogue of offences that have aggravating factors in relation to heritage, which is going to be good. 2011, there were 200 heritage crimes and incidents a day. Now these crimes go from things like the Fitzwilliam with the jade that was stolen from it, quite an audacious crime where they actually um, looked and cased the joint as such before it happened. And the importance of CCTV on sites came in on that one as being important is because well, after the crime and they looked back at it they actually saw the guys going in there and they saw one of the guys drinking from a drink bottle and throw the drink bottle away. Great! Because what it meant was the police could recover that drink bottle and DNA that led to actually the people involved in it. Sadly nothing was found. We got gravestones being stolen, uh, paving stones, so it's not just lead off of roofs as you see there, it's all sorts of architectural material that gets stolen. Post boxes, brick walls, arson, and sadly we see a number of monuments where the brass plaques are removed. When you look at lead roofs, it's not just the lead off the roof, it's the uh, resulting water damage caused inside, and it can be quite catastrophic when some of our churches are holding things like weddings, and other functions like that that have to be cancelled. Lastly, in relation to that one, when it comes to building materials, um, please make a point of knowing where your building materials come about, because quite innocently, you could be promoting heritage crime yourself if you don't look to the provenance of that, those materials that you're using. If a handler can't get rid of the property, then there's less likely a chance of there being thieves out there in the first place. Now, a lot of you will recognise this um, in relation to fire, where we know that we need oxygen, heat and fuel for there to be a fire. And you may well think, well, what's that got to do with crime prevention? Well, we have our own. And it's called the routine activity theory. So it works in a similar way, in as much that uh, when you're looking at crime even terrorism, but you've got to have a suitable target. You've got to have that motivated offender and a lack of capable guardian. Capable guardian is looking at things like CCTV or natural surveillance where people can look out their windows and see what's going on. Now the logos at the bottom, you'll notice some of them are changing as we go through there. PCPI is a police body, it's not an individual police force, it's a police <coughs> crime prevention initiatives uh, and that looks at uh, different organisations within it, which is part of Secured by Design and things like that. 
But when we're looking at that routine activity theory, if you can reduce the possibility of a target being vulnerable, then you reduce the chance of there being a crime. If you can put CCTV or have cultivate your neighbours so that you can have people looking over the site, again, you're less likely to be a victim of crime. And if you can remove that motivation, then that helps as well. This is uh, the 10 principles of crime prevention down the left-hand side, <coughs> which are again enlarging on what we've spoken before. So there's a number of other things that you can look at. Target harming, making it more difficult for them. Target removal, not always possible. There's a, quite a number there, I won't go through them all. And then expanding on that, you'll find that within Historic England's security suite, there's even more, 25 techniques, which gives you more of an idea. It's worth looking at Historic England's security suite. There's a number of documents there that are very useful. Um, again, the science crime prevention that we've been looking at there, further considerations to think about. Because if I can get you thinking along the lines of what can I do, what's the offender looking for, and if I can mitigate the risk by putting things in place, making it harder for them. Because our villains are lazy so and so. If they can find something that's easier to steal and change into cash, they will. So on there, uh, remove attractions where possible. If you can, if you've got security, flaunt it. But there again, from my involvement in the museum sector, I know all too well that magic word visitor experience. And you don't want this horrible ghastly sign saying that the person's being watched by CCTV. So look at where you're going to put it and how you're going to use it. There are times you can do things like that. And then another one of those bits of science, and here, again, there's another couple of uh, logos at the bottom. And this comes from the building research establishment. Basically, these are in modern day and in older products is looking at certifying the right products at the right level of security for the risk that you've got at that time. The Loss Prevention Certificate Board is part of BRE. And out of that comes one of a number of, or sorry, LPCB is one of a number of certification bodies in relation to security products. Uh, the most common one that you'll find out there is LPS 1175 crops up on a load of different <coughs> security applications and has uh, a number of different levels and grades depending on the risk. <coughs> Sorry, I'm rattling through this, um, I say mindful at the time. Um, the presentation talks about counter-terrorism. I'm not a Karen Terrorism Security Advisor, and unfortunately she can't be here. But when you're looking at what is the difference between counter terrorism and crime prevention with thieves, if you look down the left hand side, there's a bit of a chart there. Again, this is courtesy of the LPCB, uh, borrowed with pride, I think we call it. Um, and the top one is what the thief is looking for. Now, if you look there, there's not a great deal of difference. And then if you look at what the terrorist is looking for, the terrorist, basically, it stops a bit after he's committed his crime. He's not bothered about getting away, because as long as he can achieve his aims, then he's done what he needs to. But as with everything, the measures you put in place have got to uh, reflect the risk that you've got. Um, and if anything, if you're looking at any crimes out of all the crimes that happen nowadays, you're probably more likely to be a victim of cybercrime than anything else. Because cybercrime is more likely to affect you with fraud and so on, because you all need to have data. As I mentioned before, um, your measures have got to be risk commensurate and appropriate. On the left hand side is uh, a colleague of mine, a bit of an artist, knocked up at um, the graphics. Uh, that's me, I suppose to be me. And you don't need shutters, you don't need cameras that stand out. The security that you can have can be compatible to the historic environment. If you look to the, uh, the right of your picture, that's uh, 17th century Grade 1 listed building, Orleans House in Essex. Lovely place, if you haven't been there, have a visit. 
But that security that's there, it's a listed building, so you can't put anything you want there. Yet alongside the building, to the left of the picture, there's a column with CCTV there. It's not interfering with the visitor experience. I didn't know it was there until I actually went there on another matter and started looking around at the security. Um, to the right of that column with a CCTV camera on it, there's a little post there. Uh, detection equipment so that anyone moving around the site at night is picked up. So there, the security is there, but it's not in your face. So you can have security in a heritage environment. But what you're after is something which is site-specific to what you need. And that is still possible. Oh, sorry, go back a minute. In relation to that, that, one thing I did forget is when you're looking at security, don't forget to look back on history itself. Uh, within the police service, we've got this habit where we quite often give advice. And within our advice that we're given, we talk about landscaping and gardening. I'm not a landscape designer, I'm not a gardener. Yet, as police, we start giving landscaping advice. We've changed that recently in as much that the new Secured by Design guides that come out actually have been edited by people from the RHS. So our information in there regarding landscape and gardening is by the people that know. Not only that, but as a police service working with Secured by Design, we are also engaging with Bali, the British Association of Landscape Industries. So what we're hoping to do is have some effect on gardening and landscaping to try and get people to think about defensive planting and using that medium. Um, and talking about secured by design, and, and then there's sole secure. If you look along the bottom, there's a company there called Keith Carrier that I came across. And you look at their locks there, they may not have all of the um, lock standards in place to it, but they are an associate member of the Master Locksmith Association. So you can look for specialist heritage-based materials out there. Sold Secure, again, is a third-party testing. Secured by design, as I mentioned, if you don't know what it is, um, works a lot with new builds. So we try and design out crime at planning level so that when these new builds are built, um, the crime isn't built in there. But there is a standard that's available for refurbishments and properties that are older, which is a silver or a bronze <laughs> standard. And when you're looking at it, there are heritage compatible products. Uh, to the left there, you've got Selector Glaze, which do secondary glazing. And again, that's fit for the heritage environment. Um, across to the right, Defender Strip, it's like a plastic spiky topping. Uh, where there's lead there, so that can be moulded round the downpipe and put up there. This is again accepted by local conservation officers and councils. That one there is uh, a listed property and they couldn't just put anything on that downpipe. Below that, Mumford and Wood from Tiptree in Essex, uh, they provide windows that are of a heritage nature. Um, moving across, hammer glass is a perspex like material that can, is quite often used to protect stained glass windows. Below that, Protect Global is a fog cannon, or, and uh, that can go in buildings, creates a fog in front of your hand. You can't see your hand in front of your face. So if you can't see it, you can't steal it. And then below, Smart Water Selects DNA, a number of products that are available for stone. Um, Selects DNA at present is even doing one which is suitable for underwater for the wrecks we have around the country. Bangham um, actually produce locks and doors, and again, for the heritage environment. Further information and guidance, um, one of the things I would say is if you have a heritage project, then please speak to conservation officers, Historic England, IHBC, who can put you in contact with a heritage consultant. Um, other areas, the museums, the Art Council has a Collections Trust toolkit, churches, the Diocese of Advisory Committee and the National Churches Trust. So there are a number of different ones out there. And last but not least, don't forget the police. Uh, we can help designing our crime officers are in, in different areas. Um, we saw out in your packs, this sort of document has a lot of Historic England documents in there, but that's not all of Historic England's documents. There is a whole suite 
of security documents, as you can see there, from Historic England. Uh, they're at present being reviewed, and they will be updated. And then moving on from that, oh, no, sorry, I think, uh, I think I've, I've missed the slide. There we go. Um, the people that you can seek advice from. Uh, and across to the right, there's, uh, again, you know there's a problem when someone produces a book on heritage crime. Uh, that book is quite interesting if you want to know uh, the science behind heritage crime. I'll quickly move ahead. And getting right towards the end now, which I think is probably about the right time, uh, we talk about partnership working. Involve your local community and around different places in the country there are heritage watches. Um, it started in Cheshire, Hertfordshire, and that magic term borrowed with pride. And <laughs> we in turn in Essex borrowed it from Hertfordshire. Uh, I helped York and Kent set their heritage watch schemes up. Um, different heritage watches work in different ways. Ours in Essex is largely community based, <laughs> Kent is largely uh, business based. So a lot of the heritage businesses work together. But the great idea is trying to use your local communities. And I'd like to thank you, as I say, for your attention. If you do have any queries, then please drop me a line. And the last one I've got up there is what I mentioned is a few websites that you may wish to call. Thank you.